Christ receive his sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receive his sinful men. Come and he will give you rest. Trust him for his word is plain. He will take the sinful list. Christ receive his sinful men. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive his sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receive his sinful men. Now my heart condemns me not. Here before the law I stand. He who cleansed me from all spot, satisfied its last demand. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive his sinful man. Make the man see clear and plain. Christ receive his sinful man. Christ receive his sinful man, even me with all my sin. Purge from every spot and stain, heaven within my enter in. Sing it o'er and o'er again. Christ receive his sinful man, make the message clear and plain. Christ receive that sinful man. All righty, let's turn over to page number 299. Let's sing glory to his name. Page 299. <clears throat> right on that verse. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of blood. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of blood. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain to save from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of light. Glory to His name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast a poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of blood. Glory to His name. All righty, you can be seated. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to church today. Did you grab the announcement sheet? All right, just a couple announcements for you today. Uh, do have the uh, choir singing coming up. Uh, that'll be the 25th of October, uh, 6 p.m. Brother Caleb will be preaching. Choir will be singing the vans will leave here at 4.30. So if you show up at 4.35, we'll see you next time. <laughs> uh, but no, we'll be leaving at 4.30 uh, that day. Uh, New Waters men's meeting is October the 20th through the 22nd. Um, I need to speak to all the men today. They need a number today for who is and who isn't coming and staying and all that good stuff. Uh, so speak all the men that are here today, speak to me after service so I can get a list together. Uh, to send over to Brother Paul so they know how much food to have and we can get us a room and stuff for those that are staying. Uh, so speak with me after church, men. I'll be in the back and trying to remember on your way out. And then camp meeting, the new man is coming up this week, October the 6th 
through the 8th. Uh, October 31st, Trunk or Treat, and then November the 6th will be our Fall Festival. Um, all right, I think that's all the announcements I have at this time. It's a good day to serve the Lord, amen? amen. I know that our numbers are kind of down today. We've got families on vacation. Uh, the Lord didn't answer a prayer this week. Brother Joe and Brother Caleb are not in rooms next to each other. Uh, but we can still serve the Lord even though that prayer didn't get answered, all right? All right, let's all stand. Let's take this time to have a hand shaking. Shake somebody's hand next to you. And uh, let's just enjoy some time with the Lord today, amen? All right. Let's all stand, grab your songbook, page 172. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has give. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he does love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee, when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. Oh, there is only one song I can sing, when in its beauty I see the great King. There shall my song in eternity be, oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves even me. All righty, we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer. For those of you who want to come gather in around this altar, let's be mindful. Let's be mindful this morning of, of what the Lord's trying to do. I ask you to I ask y'all to pray for us today. Pray for Brother Zach and be preaching. A lot of needs going on today and a lot of things the Lord knows about. I'm glad that even in the midst of troubling times, God is still on the throne. And it's it's an honor. We ought to count it an honor and a privilege that we get to come to the house of God today. Let's be mindful of that. Let's ask the Lord to help us today. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for being so good to us. Father, we're so unworthy of your love. Father, we're so unworthy of your mercy and your grace, and yet you continue to supply our needs. You continue to allow us to wake up every morning. 
God, you're so good to us. God, I want to thank you just for being good. Lord, if all you've done was save me, that would be enough, God. But Lord, you've you've been way better to me than that. And Lord, I'm so unworthy of your mercy. I'm so unworthy of all the things you do in my life, God. And I just want to give you thanks. God, I ask that you'd help us today. Lord, I pray you'd give our give our pastor and his family give them give them give them a good time away, strengthen them back up when they get back. And Lord, I pray you'd help help us today that are here. Lord, you know all the needs that are going on. Lord, you know all the needs and the requests of, that are being made brought to you, God. Lord, I pray that you'd answer those today. God, we're so Lord, we're so unworthy that we could come, that we would have the opportunity to come before you and bring our burdens to you. And that you actually care enough that you would want to do something about it, God. Lord, I just want to I just want to give you thanks for it. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. I want to ask you to have, to have your way in this service. Lord, you know that heart that's here today that's broken. Lord, you know that person here, to here today that's lost. God, you know that family that's struggling and needing a touch from you. God, I pray you'd give them what they need and what they desire. God, I ask you to help us today. Help, Lord, I ask you to have your way in Jesus' name and in everything give thanks. Amen. maybe going on seven. And as many times as I get in this pulpit, I still get nervous. I still get butterflies in my stomach. And uh, little kids are not quick to forget to let you remember that you forgot something in the pulpit. Uh, Darwin, won't you stand up for me, buddy? We're shaking hands. He said, you forgot my birthday. His birthday was yesterday. How old are you, Darwin? He's five. Let's give him a round of applause this morning. I just get a one-track mind sometimes. I get my mind and I just forget to do everything sometimes. Uh, but thank the Lord for another day to serve him. All right, this morning we've got Sister Caitlin with us today. And she's brought her boyfriend and they're going to sing for us this morning. I'm, I said that backwards. We've got Brother Tyler this morning. And he's, he's brought his girlfriend, Sister Caitlin, with him. And uh, they're going to sing for us. Why don't you all come on and make your way up here. I like to give Brother Tyler a hard time. And uh, he knows that. And... Uh, he laughs, and then he cries when he gets home, I think. <laughs> Mostly laughing. No, I, I love Brother Tyler. I texted him last night and asked him to sing for us today, knowing that Brother Caleb wouldn't be here. I know some of y'all like to hear the choir sing, uh, but I can't. I, I don't do a very good job leading the choir with no piano music. Uh, I'm just not that, I'm not that good yet. Y'all pray for me. The Lord will get me there someday. Um, but I'm thankful for his uh, willingness to serve the Lord, and uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. Y'all sing for us. souls have tested him throughout the course of time so many still reach out to him with broken hearts and lives every one of them will say without exception that they find that Jesus never fails even in the days of old when he brought his people through 
And then he came to show his love and died for me and you. Then he rose again to prove that every story had been true, that Jesus never failed. Oh, and I know Jesus never fails. I know Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You will not prevail because Jesus never fails. Sometimes this world brings trouble I find so hard to bear I know I could not make it without Jesus being there It's so encouraging to know However deep you're in despair That Jesus never fails so what, what can, can I do, I do to, to prove to you? Tell me, how could you deny that there's no untold facts, no mysteries? It's all so cut and dry. On the witness stand of your life, I'll be the first to testify that my Jesus never fails. Oh, and I know Jesus never fails. I know Jesus never fails. You might as well get thee behind me, Satan. You will not prevail because Jesus never fails. You might well get thee behind me Satan you will not prevail because Jesus never When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Those He saves are His delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For 
for my life he bled and died christ will hold me fast justice has been satisfied he will hold me fast raised with him to endless life he will hold me fast till our faith is turned aside when he comes at last he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast. There's a covenant sweet that was written for me it's a promise that i could be healed from my sin and my shame even heartache and pain it was sealed and confirmed on a hill so I rest my case at the cross For now I have someone to champion my cause I've been justified, satisfied Oh, I have it all So I rest my case at the cross don't feel sorry for me when you see i'm in need there's a judge who grants mercy and love all my burdens he lifts all my sin he forgives every trial is won through his blood so I rest my case at the cross For now I have someone to champion my cause I've been justified, satisfied Oh, I have it all So I rest my case at the cross don't feel sorry for me when you see I'm in need. There's a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts and all my sin he forgives. Every trial is won through his blood. So I rest my case at the cross for now i have someone to champion my cause i've been justified satisfied oh i have it all so i rest my case at the cross this covenant is binding by his blood and his word every time i'm in trouble my case will be heard i've been justified satisfied oh i have it all so i rest my case at the cross this covenant is binding by his blood and his word 
Every time I'm in trouble, my case will be heard. I've been justified, satisfied, oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Leave satisfaction guaranteed, amen? It says, I've been justified, I'm satisfied. Oh, I have it all. Love that song. Will there be somebody with a word on your heart? Something you want to say or do at this time? Anything at all. All right, if not, turn your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. 1 Samuel chapter number 16. I struggle sometimes preaching Sunday mornings and Sunday nights on what to preach because you you want to do the Word of God justice and you don't want to just pull certain verses out and do certain things. And uh, since I don't get the opportunity to preach consistently Sunday mornings or Sunday night, sometimes it's hard for me to figure out what the Lord would have me to do. Does that make sense? Like Brother Caleb, Sunday nights, we know he's going to be going through the book of Daniel. Wednesday nights right now, he's going through the book of Romans. And Sunday mornings are typically just overflow from his Bible reading and studying. And uh, the Lord led me here this morning through a podcast I was listening to. And it's the Preacher's Workshop podcast. And they were talking about uh, the preacher and his social media. And one of the preachers on there made this statement. He said, reputation is what people think you are, and your testimony is what you really are. And he was talking about the reputation and the testimony that we portray in this world. And how this life that we live, how that we try to live a life for the Lord is our testimony. And how that it's more than just what we say, it's what we do, and how we live, and how we act. And I... Racked my brain all week with what the Lord may have me to preach. And then yesterday I was mowing the grass listening to this podcast. And the Lord stuck this out to me and gave me this passage here in 1 Samuel chapter number 16. We've got here Samuel. as uh, He's already come through. He's, he's anointed Saul to be king, which we're going to get into a little bit later in the message. Chapter number 15 is where Saul... Uh, disobeys the Lord. Brother Tony read from this passage Wednesday night where uh, Samuel said it's better to obey than to sacrifice. And here in chapter number 16, verse number 1, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint uh, shalt anoint unto me him who I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This morning for just a few minutes, I don't plan on being very lengthy. I said it Wednesday night, the greatest lie I told in the pulpit is if you'll listen fast, I'll preach fast. 
I, I don't believe that. I, it doesn't matter how fast you sit there and listen, he's going to take you a sweet time preaching his message. But just for a few minutes this morning, I want to bring this thought to you is what is your testimony? And I want to break down chapter, verse number 7 there. The Bible says there in verse number 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. First and foremost, I want you to see the appearance of a testimony. Look with me at verse number 12. We're just going to skip a few verses here. Verse number 12, the Bible says, And he sent and brought him in, talking about David. Samuel has went through and he's looked at all of the children of Jesse and he's decided that none of these boys that Jesse has sat in front of him is the one that God wants to anoint as king. And he says, that he asked Jesse if he's got any more sons. He said, well, I've got one more. He's the youngest and he's out watching the sheep. And he told him to fetch and go get, Je go get David. And there in verse number 12, the Bible says, and he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. First and foremost, we see here the countenance, which is appropriately the human face, the whole form or the face of system of features or someone's visage. That is the countenance that David had. We see here the Bible says that he was ruddy. All my life I thought the word ruddy just meant small or scrappy so to say, but that's not what the word ruddy means. It's somebody that is red of face, a child. Josh Tucker, you'd be ruddy. You got rosy cheeks, my friend. I went to high school with a boy, he had rosacea, and his whole face was just red all the time. And that's what David was. He was a small, insignificant little boy. The Bible said that uh, of a beautiful countenance, he, he was just pretty to look at. I can't tell you how many people have talked about how pretty my son is or how pretty my little girl is and how much they hope they, they outgrow looking like me. Listen, it'll never happen, so quit praying that'll happen, all right? He's always going to look like me, and that's just the way it is. But the Bible says that David had a beautiful countenance. And God said there in verse number 7, the first thing he said, to look not on his countenance. The Lord doesn't look at how beautiful we are on the outside. The Lord doesn't look at how, how we present ourselves on the outside. We see his beauty here. David was ruddy. He was red-faced. He wasn't what you thought a king should look like. If somebody told me tomorrow that we're going we're gonna to anoint somebody to be king, I'm going to want the manliest man we can find. I'm going to want the biggest man we can find that I think can take care of the people, right? That wasn't David. David was a little boy, a little runt, red-faced, young, had no business leading the people. And guess what? David had some growing up to do. It's going to be 40 years before David becomes king. But here we see Samuel anoints David to be king. Why? Because God didn't care how he looked. God was worried about what was on the inside. You can come in here this morning with your fanciest clothes on, it's just make up your best haircut, the best shave you've had in your life. And guess what? God doesn't care. God doesn't care about that. Now, we as people care about that. Brother Caleb makes fun of my beard all the time because I don't trim the sides down. I just like having a full beard. That's, that's me. He makes fun of that. You know why that is? Because the way my beard looks. Because we care about the way other people look. If I'd have come in here this morning with a cut-off tee and 1970 basketball shorts and barefoot, would anybody take me seriously today? Probably not. You'd all laugh at me and tell me to get out of here. The way someone looks. Appearances are important. I believe you should take care of yourself, take care of the way you look. But that doesn't matter so much to God. God doesn't look on our countenance. God doesn't care if you spent $40 on that makeup palette or $170 on that makeup palette. He doesn't care about that. God doesn't care if you're coming here with the fanciest suit coat you could afford or the nicest t-shirt in the drawer. He doesn't care about our, our, our appearance. He didn't care about the appearance of David. David. You know what David was? David was faithful. 
Jesse sent for all his sons, and you know what David done? He kept doing what his dad told him to do. He didn't go off and leave them sheep by themselves. He kept watching those sheep because that's what his father told him to do. God didn't care about the way David looked. God cared about what was on the inside of David. And we're going to talk about that more here later. But we see the appearance of a testimony. Not only do we see the appearance of a testimony, but we also see the attributes of a testimony. Second part of verse number 7, he says there, or on the height of his stature. Turn with me back to chapter number 10. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, just a few pages back. First, under the attributes of a testimony, I want you to see Saul's prominence. Verse number 24, the Bible says here, I'm sorry, verse number 23. The Bible says, and they ran and fetched him, talking about Saul. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Saul was taller than all those around him. Sometimes it's those who stand out the most that are the ones that will burn out the fastest. Growing up in a church, I can't tell you how many teens and adults I've seen get super on fire for God, and you think they're going to make it. And I can't tell you where they're at today. They're not serving the Lord. They're not in church. I have gave this testimony before. If he was here, I'd say it to his face. My cousin that we just celebrated his life a couple weekends ago with the camping trip, he was always the one. He would get super on fire for God from time to time. The first time I can remember handing out gospel tracts, I've told this here before, he just got so full of the whole. I mean, he got full of the Spirit one Sunday morning. And he said, we're going to go out and pass out gospel tracts today. And I said, what are you talking about, John? I ain't giving nothing to nobody. I, I ain't talking to nobody I don't know. That was the attitude I had. And guess what? I passed out gospel tracts that day. Because he had such a fire in him. But the problem was it would burn out so fast. Saul, here in this verse, you know what it says? That he was hiding. Saul was a man that did not want to be king. He just wanted to live for the Lord. Saul did, started out right. Saul had the, a, a good attitude when he started, Brother Seth. He had a, an attitude of serving the Lord. It says he was hiding when they tried to find him to anoint him as king here. They had to go looking for him. But the problem was, he didn't turn out right. He ends up disobeying God because it doesn't matter how we look on the outside. This was a man that you would think, man, he should be the king. He's bigger than the rest of us. If, I mean, you have one bad guy come up to him, he's going he's to whoop him. Find out later that there was one bad guy that came up to him named Goliath, and they didn't want to have no part of dealing with Goliath. But we see Saul's problem here, his, uh, his, uh, his prominence. He was so tall, he made himself known, not, not through the way, what he said, not through how he acted, but just through who he was. There's people in my life that have made themselves prominent, not because of the things they do or the things they say, but just because of the life that they live. I've heard it said that you may be the only Bible that some people ever read. Anybody ever heard that before? Raise your hand if you've heard that. That's true. You work with people that don't go to church. You go to school with people that don't go to church. And guess what? You may be the only Christian they ever encounter in their life. And the way that you act around them, the way that you talk around them, the way that you live around them is important. We see Saul's prominence there in verse number 23. Not only do we see his prominence, but we see Samuel's preference in verse number 24. The Bible says, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him who the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Samuel seen Saul as somebody who could lead the people. Back in our passage of chapter number 16, Samuel saw Eliab and saw somebody that could lead the people. 
But Samuel was not basing his opinion on their character, but on their looks. These were the men that he had chosen, not because of their heart, but because of the way that they appeared to him. When he saw Eliab there in uh, verse number 7, or verse number 6, I'm sorry, he said, it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. No, he was not. Samuel had a preference, just like we have a preference. We see people. We look at people and we think, man, that's, that's somebody right there. Because we're looking at them through our fleshly eyes and not through the Word of God. We see Samuel's preference. We as man read books by their covers. I look at somebody and I make a quick judgment if they're a Christian or not, if they're living right or not, just based on how I, how I think they appear, which is wrong. Right? We should be looking at the inside, not the outside. We see Samuel's preference. Not only do we see Samuel's preference, but we see David's potential. Turn with me to chapter number 17. David's been anointed king in chapter number 16. Chapter number 17 is the story of David and Goliath. Verse number 24 of chapter number 17, the Bible says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David, just a young, ruddy, red-faced little boy, standing here with all these soldiers in the, in the king's encampment, has the biggest heart of them all. These men are terrified of this giant, and here's this little boy. Well, what are we going to do about this guy, fellas? That was his attitude. Verse number 27, And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness. Eliab thought the worst of David. How many of y'all think the worst of your siblings? You don't have to lie. I mean, God's watching. Me and my brother was at my dad's house after our camping trip talking about something. And my dad accused us of being hateful to each other. Okay? It is what it is. I wasn't trying to be. But that's how we've been our whole lives. I can remember at one time, me and my brother... Me and Noel had went over to my mom and dad's house. My brother was hiding in my dad's garage with an airsoft rifle. And he went to shoot me with that airsoft rifle. So I kicked the bumper off his car. Now, if you'll remember, I set out, me and Noel was over there. I was married and living on my own, acting like a, a, a moron, child. Kicked the bumper off my brother's car because he shot me with an airsoft rifle. Because we fought all the time. Siblings fight. They argue with each other. Eliab thought the worst of David. If you go back and you read previously in this chapter, you know what you find David done? He left those sheep with a keeper. Because David cared about the things he'd been put in charge of. Not only did he leave those sheep with a keeper, but you also find that he left his carriage with a keeper. David cared about the things that had been appointed unto him. Even though Eliab had this horrible opinion of him and was running him down in front of these men, David never backed down on what he thought. He never backed down on what he was thinking. He goes on to say there in verse number 28, he says, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Brother Caleb's preached a message on this very thought, is there not a cause? 
David didn't come down here to see the battle. David wasn't there to make fun. David was there because his father sent him there. David was where he was supposed to be. And because David was where he was supposed to be, David did what the Lord had appointed unto him to do. Verse number 30, And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said, unto, or David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Now imagine Saul sitting here in his tent, speaking with a little boy. It'd be like Gavin coming up to me and telling me I'm going to go kill this nine-foot giant. I'd have a real hard time believing that, especially after watching him slide down the water slide a few times last week. I mean, he was getting it, wasn't you, Gavin? <laughs> Wide-eyed back there. But here's the thing. David wasn't trying to do this to be seen. David didn't care what people thought about him. David was doing what he knew to be right. He was trying to serve the Lord. Verse number 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. What's Saul doing here? He's looking at the outward appearance of David. Doesn't matter what David looked like. It didn't matter how little David was, how young David was. David could still do something for the Lord, amen? It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are, you can still do something for the Lord. You can still serve Him. You can still live a life for God. Verse number 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David didn't say, he made fun of me, so i got to go out there and do something about it. David was worried about the things of God. Now let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you think you can fight a bear barehanded and win. What about a lion? He said he grabbed him by the beard. I was laying in the bed last night and Elijah went to grab something that was laying on my chest and he grabbed two handfuls of hair and I almost come out of my skin, Brother Beckham, because he went to pull and I wasn't ready to move. <clears throat> I wanted to yeet him across the room when he did that, but he didn't mean to hurt me. I didn't mean to hurt him, but I think I did a little bit. It's just a natural response, you know. But David said he slew this bear and he slew this lion. And you know what he said? That uncircumcised Philistine, he's nothing to God. Nothing to God. You know why? Because David wasn't looking at the outward appearance of the giant. David was looking at what was in the inside of him. Verse number 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. David had one desire, to do the things of God. That's all he wanted to do was serve the Lord. He didn't care what it was. He didn't care if it was obeying his father's commands. He didn't care if it was taking food and milk and cheese to his brothers down where they're fighting. He just wanted to be faithful and obedient. And he was going to do that through the defeat of Goliath. David cared about the things of God. He cared about serving the Lord. But David did not rely on himself. He relied on God. Pharaoh, he didn't care about his own well-being. He just wanted to do something for the Lord. There's stories of missionaries that go off into foreign countries who never come home because they wanted to go do something for the Lord. The safest place that you can be today is in the will of God. We see the attributes of a testimony. Lastly, and I'll be done, we see the abnormality of a testimony. 
The Bible says there in verse number 7, But the Lord looketh on the heart. 1 Samuel chapter number 11, I won't read it for the sake of time, but we have the account of the sin of David. David's in his home where he's not supposed to be. He should be out at war with his people. But David stays home, and he sees a woman bathing on her rooftop, and he comes for her and has her come to his home. He lies with her, and they conceive and have a child. And David has her husband killed, has him placed on the front lines. I'm shortening all this. If you want to know more, read chapter number 11 of 1 Samuel. But David commits a sin here in chapter number 11. We see the error of David. Not only do we see the error of David, but the exposure of Nathan. First, Second Samuel chapter 12. I'm sorry, I said 1 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter number 12. The Bible says, The Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup. It lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock, and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man, but he was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was to come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Even somebody that has lived their life serving the Lord, dedicated to the things of God, can still be blinded by sin. I don't care how long a man's been preaching, he can still become a failure to sin. I don't care how long you've been a Sunday school teacher, you can still give in to the temptation of sin. I don't care if you've been saved 700 years, you can still give in to the temptation of sin. That is the abnormality of a testimony. You can, live a, you can live a life dedicated to the things of God and make one little mistake. And guess what? Your whole testimony can be ruined. The whole thing. I can name preachers today that have been called the greatest preachers in the country that messed up their testimonies, that messed up their churches, I can name people today that are not in church anymore because of the mess-ups of preachers and pastors. I can name pastors that are no longer, or I can name preachers that are no longer pastoring because of the sins and lives of congregation members that just got to them. David lived a life dedicated to God, and he still messed up. Friend today, you can mess up too. Every one of us can mess up. I was praying one time, and I can't remember who it was. I think it was Noel asked me. I, I made the statement, I'd, Lord, protect me from me. I think it was you that asked me that. And she said, what does that mean? I said, I can mess anything up, and I want the Lord to keep me safe from myself. Because guess what? You know who's going to mess up Brother Zach's testimony? It's going to be Brother Zach. Brother Seth, there's nothing you can do that will mess up my testimony. But all it takes is one message sent to somebody. One wrong conversation. One wrong thing. And my testimony shot out of the water. Our reputation, what people think about us, that's important to us. But what should be more important to us is our testimony that the Lord knows about. Because guess what? I can come in here on Sunday morning wear my nicest suit coat. I can go to work and never say the first cuss word. Listen to people at work and living a life for the Lord. It's all for naught. If at home I'm abusing my family and running the preacher down as soon as we get outside of these four walls, 
guess what? It's all for naught. If I don't live a life, it doesn't matter what I wore to church on Sunday morning. It doesn't matter that I never missed a Wednesday night. It doesn't matter that I always gave to the offering. Those things don't matter to the Lord. What matters to the Lord is what's in your heart today. David's testimony is found in Acts chapter number 13. The opposite end of the Bible, so to say. Acts 13, verse number 21. And afterward they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. That's the testimony of David today, is that he was a man after the heart of God. We get worried about our reputation and what other people think about us and see in us, but what we should be more worried about is our testimony and what we're doing for the Lord. Let's all stand, Brother Connor, make your way up here, Brother Beckham. So many times in this life we get worried about what people think of us and how people see us and what we should really be worried about today is how much am I doing for the Lord? How's your walk with the Lord today? Are you living in sin? Well, you can turn from that. Are you failing God? You can turn to Him. Don't just be a person of words today. It's easy to come in here on Sunday morning and talk about how much we love the Lord and how much we want to serve the Lord. It's another thing entirely, another thing entirely to live a life for the Lord. David, after being made aware of his sin, you know what we find that he done? He turned back to God. He repented of his sin. He went and prayed and fasted that maybe the child would not die, but the child died anyways. And you know what we don't find? David didn't give up on God because his sin. David turned back to the Lord and lived a life dedicated to the Lord. So much so that even after his sin, the Bible leaves us with this testimony of David, is that he was a man after God's own heart. Are you somebody after God's own heart today? Take this time to reflect on that and come use the altar if you need to. Brother Connor, what page you got?